fan gets all day. I want to see the words. I'm on. All right. Well, good morning. It is January the 10th, despite what the pre-service slide loop said. We're going to arrange for some remedial calendar reading for the slide maker. Uh, we're here in Kepley Hall, here at St. Philip Lutheran in Raleigh, North Carolina. And it is a great day uh, to come and worship the Lord. You've already heard those beautiful people. Look at the size of that musical group over there in number, in number only. But let me go ahead and put some names on those faces, although you probably already know them. Chuck's over there on vocals. It's good to have him with us. In the back, not a new face, but 
been, been gone for a little while. Notice she's got a fine head of hair as compared to other uh, drummers we have. Preston is on drums this morning. Well, and compared to some worship leaders, but we don't worry about that. Carol's on vocals right next to, <laughs> I'll keep moving on here because I'm gonna get in trouble. And Catherine is on bass and vocals. Catherine's also our worship coordinator this morning. So she's the one that makes the liturgy and the words and the songs all fit together. And we deeply appreciative of her efforts. Alan's on lead guitar, uh, then that's, that's good. And you wouldn't be hearing or seeing any of this were it not for Brian back there managing the, uh, the OBS and the mixer and Lisa, who's gonna keep the slides going. She's gonna try to keep me out of trouble. I'm guessing she can't do that because <laughs> nobody can. Uh, let me just hit a few events and then we'll move on quickly before I get in more trouble. It's drive through community today, 1230. Everybody knows the rules, symptom free, please. Keep your mask on, stay in the car and there will people out there will direct you uh, where to go. Wednesday night on Zoom uh, is uh, Wednesday Night Live. <laughs> That's what comes up at 6.30 on Wednesday. Uh, during the service, I invite you all to, at some point, uh, loosen up your fingers and type into your uh, keyboard or your on-screen keyboard, whatever you've got, and uh, connect with us and your fellow worshipers. Today is a festival day. How do we know that? Well, we know that because we're Lutherans and the pyramids are white. Well, what does that mean? Well, we all know what the big festival deals are, right? It's just been a few weeks. Christmas was around. We celebrated the birth of our Savior. And then we kept the white pyramids up through Christmas too when the Magi got into town. And they came to worship and visit the, their Savior, the Jesus, where they were staying. We won't get into the, the details of that. And coming up in February, there's going to be another day when the pyramids are going to be white. So you want to be watching for that. But today is a, quote, minor festival of the church. It is the baptism of our Lord. Now, this is not the baptism that you or I received. This was not the baptism of an infant. Even though Jesus, we were just celebrating the birth of our Savior a couple weeks back, and the Magi got into town and they came and worshiped the child. This is Jesus now probably closer to age 30. He's about to start his public ministry. And this may be the first public encounter between Jesus and his cousin, John. But there's more going on there than that. And so you wanna watch because the pastor might talk about it in his sermon. <laughs> he might not. He's always over there going, yeah, maybe not. But if you don't know what's significant about today, by the time the service is over, you send me something on Facebook and I will inform you what I believe is to be the significance of why the pyramids are white this morning. Okay, so we're gonna do a little bit of a congregational business this morning, and that is we're going to install the members who are here of our 2021 Congregation Council. So at this point, they're gonna move the camera off of me over there in front of the band people. And I call on the folks who are here from the Congregation Council to come and be installed. And I'm gonna let Pastor Tim do the thing. Good morning. I am Pastor Tim Poston. It is my honor, privilege, and delight this morning to install the leaders of our church, our church council. Some of them are here with us today, and you can see them on the screen now. Uh, some are attending online, and so are out there, as it were. Uh, but we install them all today as our elected and appointed leadership of our church, St. Philip Lutheran Church here in Raleigh. The following people have been elected by the congregation to positions of leadership. We give thanks for their willingness to serve. In baptism, we are welcomed into the body of Christ and sent to share in the mission of God. We rejoice now that these sisters and brothers will lead us in our common life and our mutual mission as a congregation. President Mike Davis, Vice President Dawn Knupp, Mark Andrews, Shelley Bauer, Kathy Cunningham, Lisa Fairclaw, Julie Helmy, Ed Peterson, 
Waylon Smedley, Ron Ubertini, Kent Williams, and our youth representative, Kelsey Weinzapfel. Also, under appointed positions, Secretary Louise Balknight, Treasurer Lisa Faircloth, and Financial Secretary Sue Kearney. A reading from 1 Corinthians. There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You have been elected to positions of leadership and trust in this congregation. You are to see that the words and deeds of this household of faith bear witness to God, who gathers us into one together with the whole church. You are to seek to involve all members of this congregation in worship, learning, witness, service, and support, so that the mission of Christ is carried out in this congregation, in the wider church, in this community, and in the whole world. You are to be faithful in your specific area of serving, that the Spirit who empowers you may be glorified. You are to be examples of faith, active in love, fostering peace, harmony, and mutual understanding in this congregation. On behalf of your sisters and brothers in Christ, I now ask you, will you accept and faithfully carry out the duties of the offices to which you have been called? If so, please respond, I will, and I ask God to help me. People of God, I ask you, will you support these, your elected leaders, and will you share in the mutual ministry that Christ has given to all that are baptized? If so, please respond, we will, and we ask God to help us. We will, we will and, and we, we ask, ask God, God to help, help us. I now declare you installed as officers and council members of this congregation. May Almighty God bless you and direct your days and your deeds in peace that you may be faithful servants of Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you may be seated. And now we begin in the name of the Father. We believe, we believe in God, God the Father, Father creator and lover of the earth, earth origin and destiny of us all. In the name of the Son. We believe in Jesus the Christ, God coming to us in the fragile promise of a newborn baby who emerges as the herald of hope. God's laughter in the face of despair. Plunged into death and hell, he broke free the captives and is leading the way to the promise, promise where justice and peace will flourish. And in the name of the Spirit. We believe in the Holy Spirit who implants the seed of truth, brings us to birth as the body of Christ, and empowers us to confront and transform all that is corrupt, degrading, and deceitful. We believe in the coming reign of God announced by the Baptist. It has drawn near to us in Jesus and will be consummated in the glorious marriage of earth and heaven. When all who have passed through the world's deep sorrow will be raised from the waters, robed in righteousness and gathered into the joyous fulfillment of God's future. For the coming of that day on this day, we work and pray. Amen. Jesus, come. Amen. And now let us confess our sins. We are incredibly stubborn, O Lord, we have entered the season in which your light has been given to the world. Your blessings have been poured out on the world. 
and yet, yet all, all we, we can think, think about is our, our own, own problems, problems our, our own needs, needs our, our own, own desires. Help, help us, us to desire you, Lord. Help us to yearn for your presence. Pour your baptismal waters over us again, cleansing us from our self-pity and arrogance. Nourish and heal us so that we may joyfully serve you. Wash away our jealousy, greed, and all negative thoughts and behaviors that stand in the way of our truly being the people you have called us to be. Again, let us receive the blessings offered in creation, in the birth and baptism of Jesus, and in the ministry of the saints and light. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The love of God is always offered to us freely, joyfully, for all eternity. Rejoice, dear friends. This is the good news of our Lord. Amen. Amen. God has received us, pardoned us, and loved us. Let us forgive each other in love and share the peace of Christ. God's peace be with you. And also, and also with you. you. God's peace. God's peace. God's peace. God's peace be with you.
by unmute. Now our gospel lesson actually does come to us from the first chapter of Mark. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and a spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be God. to God. And now together we pray. Almighty, Almighty God, God, you, you anointed, anointed Jesus, Jesus at his baptism with, with the Holy Spirit, Spirit and reveal him as your beloved son. Keep all who are born of water and the spirit faithful in your service that we may rejoice to be called children of God. Through Jesus Christ, our savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
morning. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord, we pray for our nation. Most of all, we pray for truth. Turn us away from falsehood and lies. Have us embrace truth and be freed. We repent. Heal us. Unite us. Forgive us. Grant us peace and reconciliation. We thank you for our system of government, for checks and balances, increase our capacity to love, to serve, and to seek justice, justice not according to our standards, but to yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> My sermon text for this morning is the gospel lesson, Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. It is the story of Jesus' baptism by his cousin John the Baptist in the River Jordan. Uh, today is, of course, the baptism of our Lord Sunday, a chance for us to remember and celebrate his baptism and to reflect on our own baptism. My sermon title for today is The Power of a Voice That Blesses. The Power of a Voice That Blesses. We have undergone a jarring transition textually and liturgically since the last time we gathered for worship. Indeed, we do every year in the first several days of January. We have just emerged from that brief 12-day season of Christmas when we celebrate the incarnation, the nativity, the birth of the Christ child. When we last saw him, Jesus was only days old, wrapped in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger, serenaded by shepherds and livestock, and briefly presented in the temple, acknowledged by the prophets Simeon and Anna. January 6th, just this past Wednesday, is always the day of Epiphany, marked by the Magi's or wise men's visit to the toddler Jesus, led from the east by Bethlehem's star, bearing gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It is believed by most that Jesus would most likely have been around the age of two at the time of the Magi's visit. It would have taken two years, you see, to travel at foot speed from Persia, 
their likely point of origin. And, of course, upon hearing of the birth of this rival king, King Herod slaughters all infants in Bethlehem two years old and under. And so now, today, the first Sunday after the Epiphany, we always celebrate the baptism of our Lord, which commemorates the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. So in the span of two weeks, a mere 14 days, Jesus has gone in our scriptural readings and in our church year observance from a newborn to a toddler to a 30-year-old man. My, how time flies. If that transition seems jarring, it's because the biblical record itself is. Aside from a very brief story of the 12-year-old Jesus lost in Jerusalem in Luke's gospel, there is nothing at all recorded about him from the age of infancy to the age of 30. Many scholars refer to these as simply the missing years of Jesus, or alternatively the hidden years or the lost years. Incidentally, only Matthew and Luke have infancy accounts of Jesus at all. Mark and John simply begin their accounts with Jesus as a fully grown, middle-aged adult. And so the first time we encounter Jesus here in Mark, the first written of the four Gospels, he is a 30-year-old man on the banks of the River Jordan, patiently waiting his turn to be baptized by his bizarre, eccentric, and quirky cousin and forerunner, John the Baptist. John's popularity, or at least the popularity of what he is doing, is intriguing to me. Verse 4 says, he is offering a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Verse 5 follows, and people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him. That's intriguing to me because there already exists in Jerusalem, a place, a locale, a method, and a system for the forgiveness of sins, namely the temple. The temple was the house of God, the residence of God, where worship and adoration occurred. It was there that sacrifices were offered around the clock, animal and otherwise. It could be grain, wine, or incense, for example to appease, propitiate, and satisfy God and atone for the sins of the people. So it seems as if in this text, a large segment of the populace is making the decision to forsake one for the sake of the other. They're fleeing the city for the wild, Jerusalem for the Jordan River, a grand elaborate system for a quirky one-man dog and pony show. Something more public but removed for something more personal and intimate. A sacrifice of meat, grain, anything external for a sacrifice of self. A death and a burial and immersion of an old sinful self for the raising up of a new clean slate self. It seems as if Jerusalem's temple and sacrificial offerings are no longer sufficient to a people yearning for something deeper, more real, more profound, and more transformative. They seem to be clamoring for a new, fresh, and clean start in life, accompanied by the primordial element of water rather than the offering of something external. It would be as if you came in here today, no longer satisfied, with punching your Sunday morning worship time clock, going through all the motions and making what you think is a sizable financial offering. But instead, you yearned for a deeper level of repentance, a more substantial experience of renewal, a real transformation, a real reconciliation with the Almighty God that can only be affected by water, the Word of God, and the Spirit of God to constantly kill the old you and just as constantly raise up a new you each and every time you enter these unlikely banks of the Jordan. Toward that end, there is a theme that runs through our assigned assembly of readings for today a theme that could be said to be paramount, and that is the voice of the Lord. In the Bible's opening words from our first lesson assigned today from Genesis, you have God's Spirit moving over the face of the 
waters, and then God speaks. Let there be light. And there was light, and God saw that it was good. So when God's Spirit moves over water, and God speaks, His voice creates, and what He creates is good. In the psalm assigned for today, Psalm 29, the voice of the Lord is mentioned seven different times. It is over the waters. It is powerful. It is full of majesty. It breaks the cedars. It flashes forth flames of fire. It shakes the wilderness, and it causes the oak trees to whirl. Then the psalmist says that the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. So, whether water is nourishing or destructive, life-giving or life-threatening, God sits where? Over it. And when God speaks, it is thunderous, majestic, awe-inspiring, and nature itself bows in obedience such that all humanity speaks in the psalm too, but they only manage one awed response. The end of verse 9, glory. This narrative before us this morning is rightly viewed as Jesus' call narrative, at least in his human flesh. He is called by the voice of his Father in heaven. Once again, there is water below, heaven above. The Spirit of the Lord is hovering overhead, and once again, God speaks. What God says is not only sweet, nice, comforting, and reassuring. It's actually scriptural. What I mean by that is the first half, you are my son, the beloved, is almost a direct quote from Psalm 2, verse 7. You are my son, today I have begotten you. It is a messianic psalm where God claims his Messiah. The second half, with you I am well pleased, is inspired by Isaiah 42, verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. My chosen servant, in whom I, my soul, delights. This is the opening verse of Isaiah's four different suffering songs, where God chooses his servant, who, though he pleases God, is chosen to suffer For the sake of others, a fact which becomes clearer the longer those servant songs continue. So it is somewhat instructive and enlightening, I would propose to you, as we encounter Jesus' baptism and call this morning, and inevitably reflect on our own baptism and call, to realize that the voice which calls and claims Jesus calls and claims us. And the voice which chooses him and delights in him and finds him worthy also chooses him, unfortunately, to suffer. That sounds, seems paradoxical to us. God chooses us to bless us, prosper us, and have good physical health, and acquire wealth and possessions, and have great family relationships. God doesn't choose us to suffer. But in the biblical record, God chose the servant in Isaiah to suffer. Jesus' baptismal waters here will lead soon to Calvary's cross and a blood-stained body. And when God chooses his most famous messenger of all, the Apostle Paul, in Acts 9, God says, He is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the kings of the world, and I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of of my name. And later in life, when Paul is given a thorn in the flesh, three times Paul asks God to remove it, and each time God says no. He tells Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. God tells Paul, My power is made perfect in your weakness. And yet we spend all of our time avoiding weakness, avoiding suffering, not knowing that at the same time we are avoiding the call of God and the power of God on our lives. Sometimes, my friend, God calls us, and suffering and weakness are a part of that call. And when we studiously avoid and sidestep those realities and those discomforts, we limit our own call and usage by God in this world. If God's power is made perfect in weakness, many of us have no power because we refuse to be weak. 
we equate power with strength. And we utterly forget that God's power was never more on display for reconciling the world back to himself than when his own son, his own flesh and blood, died, abandoned and alone, nailed to a piece of wood and left to suffocate. That is weakness. And that is power. So perhaps your own sufferings and weakness, though not that extreme, are intimately bound up with your call and your baptism. And God is using precisely those things to achieve His will for others in your sphere of influence. When I look at this baptismal text, I see the power of blessing. And I see it twofold. Lisa, you can put up the last uh, verse of the text. Number one, God the Father claims Jesus. You are my beloved Son. You are my Son. And number two, with you, I am well pleased. It seems kind of silly and gratuitous, doesn't it? Why does Jesus need to know that? Doesn't he already know it? Isn't he aware that he has already, up to this point, lived an obedient and sinful life? Is this blessing, this approval, somehow instrumental to his remaining life and ministry? Is it for the benefit of onlookers, the crowd, or us, the reader? Or is God simply wasting his divine breath? What if God had never said it? What if Jesus had emerged, empowered and equipped from the water? What if he had seen the heavens torn apart, the Holy Spirit descend upon him like a dove, but not heard the voice? Would all the rest have been sufficient? Would all the rest not have been enough? I believe that there is something significant and special about the power of a voice that blesses. Apart from affirming his messianic identity to others and onlookers, I believe myself that Jesus benefited from these words, benefited from this blessing from his Father. You are my son. I love you. And with you, I am well pleased. I believe for the remainder of his ministry, Jesus clung to these words and to this particular blessing. I believe it sustained him during 40 days of trial, testing, and temptation by Satan out in the wilderness. I believe it encouraged him when he faced opposition and rejection by Nazareth, Capernaum, Bethsaida, Chorazin, Samaria, and Gerasene. I believe it enabled him to undergo persecution at the hands of the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and the elders. I believe when he was tortured, scourged, and nailed to a cross, what got him through were these precise 11 words uttered three years earlier. You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. I believe that when he hung high on Calvary's cross, on Golgotha's site, as the memory of Jordan's cool, refreshing waters faded into a fog of pain, and the closest thing to water was a sponge sopped with sour vinegar and the blood water mix flowing from his pierced side, I believe these words to have been undiluted in his mind, as fixed as the North Star, in order to run that final lap. You are my beloved child. And with you, I am well pleased. And on this day, when we recall and celebrate the baptism of our Lord, we also recall and celebrate our own. 
Romans 6 reminds us that through our baptism, we have been united with Christ in a death like his, and we will also be united with him in a resurrection like his. And so as you continue on your life's journey, rejoicing in God's goodness, questioning his ways, wrestling with your own call, I pray that you remember that the heavenly voice which claimed Jesus is the same heavenly voice that claims you. The same God that blessed and approved of Jesus is the same God who blesses and approves of you. God sees you going through and he declares, you are my child. I love you and you please me. God sees you enduring what you shouldn't have to endure and God says, you are mine. I approve of you. The power of a voice that blesses is unmatchable and it cannot be denied. Whatever this world tells you, whatever a parent tells you, whatever a sibling or a spouse tells you, whatever a child or a grandchild tells you, whatever a boss or a boyfriend or a girlfriend tells you, whatever a friend, colleague, or enemy tells you, God says, you are my beloved daughter. You are my beloved son. And with you, with you, with you, with you, with you, I am well, well pleased. The power of a voice that blesses. Amen. We appreciate your generous and faithful gifts. It is through that support that we continue the ministries here at St. Philip. Thank you.
Let revival come. Let the people sing the glory of your name. We celebrate together now the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. Scripture tells us that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Together, let us pray as Jesus asks us. Our, Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be your name. name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come. Your, your will be done. done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. O oh God, we give you thanks that you have set before us this feast, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. By your Spirit, strengthen us to serve all in need and to give ourselves away as bread for the hungry. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We welcome you to drive through communion here at St. Philip in our parking lot from 1230 to 1 p.m. Please do remain in your cars with your masks on. We look forward to seeing you in two and a half hours to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Amen. Amen.
siblings in Christ, what is our purpose? Jesus asked that we love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. Uh, Jesus tells us that a second is like it. We shall love our neighbors as ourselves. We answer that call and we go out to share the love of Christ. Amen. We believe that your grace is stronger than all our faults and failures. We believe that your love is deeper than our hearts could fathom. We believe that with you, Jesus, we could change the world. Amen.
And now go in peace. Peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. <laughs> Whatever. I look back, Brian's back there dancing around. <laughs>